have the opportunity to invite Professor William Dewey to visit our institute. And uh, before I start my formal introduction, I would like to share with you some of my personal experience when I worked as a postdoc here. So um, usually when they were talking seminar and the bill, we will sit in the audience and ask questions. And before the questions, we will summarize the important points of the talk. <laughs> that the audience, some of the audience will start to feel they understand or feel they understand better. And as for the question to be, the speaker, also very usually, the speaker cannot answer in a straightforward <laughs> way. And they need to think about speaker in order to, to understand this question better. So, so we typically for us, you know, for a talk, you feel the pressure. The talk will be lasting for maybe I mean, one hour and a thirty minutes. <laughs> if there is no, no strict time limit. So, but in any way, so after the talk, for the speaker, the audience will benefit a lot from the field question. So, yeah. so I'm sure today we will have the same experience that the physics will be taught very fundamentally, but in a very simple and concise way. Okay. So let me start to introduce Phil. Phil received his PhD from 19, 1976, and then he did a postdoc for two years. And then he joined National Institute of Standards and Technology in 1978. And then he is currently the leader of laser cooling and charging group at the Physical Management Laboratory. And he is a distinguished <laughs> university professor at the University of Maryland. He is also a fellow of the Joint Quantum Institute, which is the, the Joint Institute of NIST and the University of Maryland. And the uh, field research group, of course, started studying the physics of auto collapse. And then in 1997, as all you know, Phil shared the Nobel Prize in physics for development of methods to cool and shut atoms. Now, let's well, welcome him. Well, thank you very much for that kind uh, introduction. It's a great pleasure to be uh, to be here. This is my first visit to to Taiwan, and I've had a uh, a wonderful time so far, learning about the great things that are going on here, uh, reconnecting with with old friends and uh, and meeting new ones. And I'm looking forward to the rest of my visit here. Uh, so, as you heard, I'm from uh, the Joint Quantum Institute. Uh, which is both NIST and uh, the University of Maryland, part of the Laser Cooling and Trapping Group. And I want to acknowledge the people uh, with whom I work on a daily basis, uh, the permanent members of this group, Gretchen Campbell, Paulette, Trey Porto, and Ian Stillman, and all of these agencies that have uh, uh, given funding to the things that I'm going to be talking about. Why condensed matter physicists should pay attention to atomic physics? Although now people tell me that I really shouldn't use that as the title of the talk. What I should use is why condensed matter physicists are paying attention <laughs> to, uh, to atomic physics. Um, so, so this is just uh, uh, an advertisement for the uh, for the joint uh, the joint quantum institute. We've been in business for about eight years now, uh, studying all sorts of uh, coherent quantum phenomena, and the things I'm going to be talking about today are among those uh, those quantum phenomena. Uh, and within that. Uh, we have a physics frontier center, and uh, we have lots of opportunities for research for young people. So if you happen to be at that stage of your career where you're interested in spending a little time outside of the country, then you might give, uh, give some thought to, uh, 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 to the JQI. Uh, okay, let's come back to the question of, of atomic physics and condensed matter physics. So, so where are atomic physics and condensed matter physics uh, intersecting these days? Well, uh, one way is in the quantum simulation of the Hamiltonians that are important in uh, condensed matter physics. There are some Hamiltonians, and their number is increasing, that we can realize. That is, we can make the model Hamiltonian with an atomic system and able to do simulations of Hamiltonians that people are interested in. And one of the reasons why it's interesting to do these simulations in atomic systems is that we can uh, control and measure different kinds of things in an atomic system than you typically can do with a condensed matter system. So for example, 
Uh, in a condensed matter system, often what you do is you hook up electrical leads and you measure current and voltage and, uh, and resistance. And what we do in atomic systems is we uh, uh, release the atoms and find out what all of the momenta of all of the atoms are, which is something that's difficult to do with all of the electrons in a, uh, in a condensed matter system. Uh, atomic physicists and condensed matter physicists bring a different perspective to problems, and sometimes it's a good idea to bring uh, different perspectives to the same problem so that you can have a better chance of uh, coming up with a good solution. Uh, there are condensed systems that we can make. Good heavens, this is left over from something else. <laughs> there, there, I, I could just as easily say, uh, say Taipei, can't I? Um, uh, but but there, are, there are condensed systems that are not available to us naturally. For example, uh, when we make a, um, uh, uh, a condensed matter sample uh, and we're trying to study the, the mobility of the electrons, the electrons are fermions. They have to be. That's the only brand that, that electrons come in. But if we have atoms that are playing the role of the charge carriers, those atoms could be either bosons or fermions. And so we could have uh, that degree of freedom, which isn't possible in a condensed matter system. Electrons have two spin states, whereas atoms can have a, uh, as few as zero spin states. And depending on the atom, we might have as many as 10 or more spin states. So there's uh, a lot of different things that you could do with atoms, with cold atoms uh, in particular, that you can't do uh, with ordinary condensed systems with, with electrons. So what are the tools that atomic molecular and optical physics uses to study interesting problems in condensed matter physics? Well, the things that I'm going to be talking about are uh, quantum degenerate gases, that is either Bose-Einstein condensates. If I take a gas of bosons, cool it down enough to the point that the uh, thermal de Broglie wavelength is approximately equal to the inner particle spacing, then it will condense into uh, a Bose condensate, as, as Einstein taught us in about 1924. It will condense into this, this wonderful state where a large fraction of the atoms are in the, uh, the motional ground state of whatever, whatever trap they're being held in. And if we do the same thing to uh, a gas of fermions, uh, nothing uh, happens in the way of a phase transition at that point, but it starts to become quantum degenerate in the same way, for example, that uh, the electrons in most metals form a quantum degenerate Fermi gas, a temperature much less than the, the Fermi temperature. So that's one of the tools. That's going to be the, in a sense, the carriers for our uh, uh, simulation of condensed matter systems is cold atoms. The other thing is optical lattices. We can make a periodic potential in which the atoms move out of light. And this simulates the periodic potential in which um, electrons move in a solid. In a solid, we have a crystal lattice. It's a lattice of, uh, of ions that are left behind from the electrons that have become mobile, for example, in a, uh, in a, in a crystal electronic solid. And uh, the electrons move in that periodic uh, potential. And we can apply externally a periodic potential that mimics the kind of periodic potential that, uh, that electrons experience in a crystalline solid. So let me say a little bit about atomic gas Bose condensates, since they're one of the major players. We produce these condensates by a combination of laser cooling and evaporative cooling. We typically have many atoms on the order of a million atoms in, in many of the experiments that we do, although people do experiments with as few as a few hundred atoms in a Bose condensate, and as many as uh, hundreds of millions of atoms in a Bose condensate. But this is typical, something on the order of 10 to the 6. The physical size <coughs> is often on the order of 100 microns, which is to say that it is macroscopic. I say it's macroscopic for the following reason. I look out and I see a lot of young people in the audience. You can see something that is 100 microns across. I cannot. <laughs> but as long as someone can see it, I figure it's macroscopic. <laughs> uh, and of course, uh, the fact that I've got something on the order of a million atoms makes it macroscopic in another sense. But perhaps more importantly is it's, um, it's many optical wavelengths. Uh, uh, optical wavelengths are typically on the order of half a micron, 
So this has many optical wavelengths. And 100 microns isn't, doesn't represent any sort of limit. People have made Bose condensates that are larger than a millimeter. And even I can see something that's a millimeter across. OK, the atom-atom interactions in a Bose condensate can either be negligible, in which case we can think of it as being a, uh, 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 an ideal gas, or they can be important, uh, in which case it's, it's a strongly interacting gas, and it can depend upon the circumstances which we can control, or it can also depend upon the time scale. So we can have both ideal gas behavior and we can have strongly interacting gas behavior depending upon how we set things up. In many respects, but not in all respects, in many respects, a Bose condensate is a gas at absolute zero. What is an optical lattice? Well, if I have two laser beams and they are counter-propagating, this sort of thing that happens all the time if you shine a laser beam in a mirror and retroreflect uh, the laser beam from that mirror, uh, it will produce a standing wave. Uh, so if I have counter-propagating laser beams, I have a standing wave, and that standing wave has a period of half the optical <coughs> wavelength, and it periodically changes from being bright to being dark, and back again in a sinusoidal way. Now, if you put an atom, let's take a very simple case, a two-level atom, into a light field, then if that light field is tuned below the resonant frequency to connect the ground state to the excited state, what will happen is the energy of the ground state will be depressed by an amount that's proportional to the intensity of the light and inversely proportional to the detuning from resonance. If the detuning is above resonance, then the ground state will be pushed up. But either way, the light field changes the energy of the atom in a way that is proportional to its intensity. So you can think of the, this change in energy, which we sometimes call the light shift or the AC star shift, that that light shift represents a sort of potential in which the atom feels itself. And if that potential varies in space, as it does in a standing wave, where the intensity varies sinusoidally from a maximum to a minimum, with a wavelength, with a, a periodicity of half an optical wavelength, then that is the potential in which the atom is moving. And so we have a periodic potential for an atom very similar to the sort of thing that, that, a, uh, uh, that, that an electron experiences in a crystalline solid, where there's a periodic arrangement of, of atoms. Now, there's another important feature that I need to talk about, and that is that there's something else that happens when you shine light on atoms that is perhaps more familiar to you, and that is that the atoms scatter the light. And we don't want that to happen. Because if the atoms scatter the light, that is, if they absorb a photon and re-radiate the photon in some random direction according to some, some radiation pattern, the recoil of uh, absorbing that, uh, that photon and re-radiating that photon in a random direction will increase the energy of the atoms, the kinetic energy of the atoms, so much that they will not be part of our condensate anymore. The energy of our atoms is so small, in fact, the energy of our atoms is limited by the uncertainty principle. The momentum of the atoms is given by the uncertainty principle limited momentum for the size of the cloud. So they're extremely low energy. And if we uh, have them recoil with the energy of a photon, that's going to increase their energy by so much that we're not interested in those atoms anymore. They're not part of the gas that we're interested in studying. And so we want uh, that photon scattering to be as low as possible. And fortunately, at least in, in the case, the simple case that I'm describing here, we can do that just by spending money. <laughs> and you know, if there's a problem that you can solve by spending money, it's not a real problem. <laughs> So, uh, so why, why can we solve this problem by spending money? The light shift is proportional to the intensity of the laser, the square of the Rabi frequency, divided by the detuning. But the scattering rate is proportional to the intensity of the laser divided by the square of the detuning. So all you have to do is tune your laser further from resonance, crank up the intensity. That's where the money comes in. <laughs> crank up the intensity to make this number as big as you want it to be, and just keep tuning it further and further from resonance while you make the intensity bigger and bigger, and this quantity, the rate of scattering, will go away, like the, the detuning, 
and you can make it as low as you want if you've got enough money to buy a laser that has enough intensity to give you the light shift you want. And we do. So we do. <laughs> so uh, we, we don't have very much light scattering in our, uh, uh, in our optical lens. Okay. So now I've been telling you that this optical lattice is a kind of analog to the periodic potential that electrons feel in a crystalline solid. Let's compare some of the, uh, uh, the features of atoms in an optical lattice compared to electrons in a solid. And of course, in making this comparison, I'm going to pick out those features that make it look like atoms in an optical lattice are really good, because that's what we do. We put atoms in optical lattices. So the optical lattice is essentially free of dislocations and impurities. Whenever you make any kind of a crystalline solid, it's always got problems. Of course, some things like silicon can be made nearly perfect, but these things always have problems. Even silicon has different isotopes in it. So there are issues having to do with the isotopic impurity of, uh, of the silicon, and most other things have dislocations in the crystals, uh, other kinds of, uh, of atoms where you want your crystal atoms to be, and our optical lattice does not have any of that because it's made with light. And the light beams themselves are extremely pure in the sense that they are single frequency laser beams. And so there aren't going to be any dislocations. There aren't going to be any uh, non-uniformities of the periodicity of this lattice. There may be um, uh, non-uniformities in the, the depths of the various potentials, but there aren't going to be any defects and there aren't going to be any impurities. The atoms, as I already mentioned before, can be either bosons or fermions. So that gives you a different degree of freedom than you have in a condensed matter system. We don't have any Coulomb interaction. Now, you can think of this as a good thing or a bad thing, but many times the interactions between the particles are not something that are good for your system. And in our case, the uh, interactions between the particles are extremely short range, so they only happen when you have more than one atom on a single lattice site. So there's no long range interaction at all. In some cases, we can have uh, dipole, dipole interactions that, that vary as one over our cube. Uh, and uh, it may even be possible in some cases, although not in the experiments I'm going to tell you about, to simulate the, uh, the behavior of, of other long range interactions, like Coulomb interactions. But it's not natural to the system. We don't have any long range interactions naturally. There are no phonons in the traditional sense. What are phonons in a usual crystalline solid? It's a vibration of the crystal lattice, and it's driven thermally. Our lattice is imposed externally using laser beams that are nearly perfect. We don't have any vibrations of our crystal lattice. If we do have a vibration of our crystal lattice, it's the entire lattice moving back and forth because the mirror from which we bounce the laser is moving back and forth. We don't have any sound waves propagating through our crystal lattice as you have all the time in a crystalline solid subject to the thermal excitations that such a thing has. So we have essentially zero phonon temperature for our lattice. In fact, we might think of ways to engineer phonons if you really want them. But it's not so easy. But we've been thinking about ways that this might be possible. We can vary our lattice constant. We don't have to take what nature gives us. If I have two counterpropagating laser beams, then the lattice constant is simply half the optical wavelength. That's the period of the lattice. Now, it's quite long. Uh, it's hundreds of nanometers compared to a few uh, tenths of a nanometer in a crystalline solid. But that just means that the scale of everything is, is longer, and the energy scale is lower. And that's fine, because that's the energy scales we operate with. Uh, but more to the point, we can change it if we want. If I'm not happy with the lattice constant that I get by having two counterpropagating laser beams, I can simply bring the laser beams together at an angle, and the lattice constant will get larger. So I can pick the lattice constant. I can also pick the lattice dimensionality. Uh, and the nature of the crystallography. Most of the things I'm going to tell you about today are very simple lattices. Uh, 
in three dimensions, we have cubic lattices, the simplest thing you could imagine. But I can do anything I want. If I want orthorhombic, no problem. I just put the laser beams in at the proper angles, and I can have any crystal structure you want. I can even have crystal structures that you might not think about. I can make quasi-crystals. I just have to use more laser beams and make them incommensurate, uh, and I will get quasi-crystals. So uh, I've got a lot more freedom than nature gives me with ordinary materials. The potential in which the atoms move is exactly known. I can calculate what the light shift of the atoms is perfectly. <coughs> I don't normally do that in uh, solids. Very typically in solids, what we do is we use some sort of an approximation, like a muffin tin potential, uh, some sort of a square well. Uh, and this leads to lots of good results. But here we know exactly what the potential is, and we can solve for the band structure exactly based on an, an exact knowledge of what the potential is. And furthermore, I can turn it on and off. I can make it stronger or weaker. I can't turn on and off the crystal lattice in a solid. It's there. <laughs> but I can turn on and off the, uh, uh, the laser beams, and I can modulate them. I can, I can, can uh, operate them at any speed I want, faster than every natural time scale in the system, or slower than every natural time scale in the system. So I've got a lot of freedom to do things that aren't the usual things that you can do in condensed matter physics. And so one, uh, one hopes, as a result, that you can do some new things. And I'm hoping to convince you that that is indeed the case. OK, so I'm just trying to see what's coming next. OK, so here are some examples of different dimensionality crystals that I can make. So by having two counterpropagating laser beams, the sort of thing I've been telling you about with my fingers, I can make what we call a 1D lattice, which is a, uh, uh, a stack of pancakes or a stack of two-dimensional systems uh, arrayed in a 1D lattice. If I have uh, four laser beams in a plane, uh, then I make a 2D lattice of two. So this is a lattice of one-dimensional systems. And if I combine these two things, then I make the ordinary uh, a 3D crystalline lattice, uh, which is a lattice of zero-dimensional points. So I can do all these different things. Uh, so now let's talk about the kind of experiments we do and the sort of measurements we can make. We start off with a Bose-Einstein condensate. Uh, so if you want to know about Bose-Einstein, Bose-Einstein condensates, ask somebody like you, Zhu. She'll show you her lab where she can make Bose condensates with, with hundreds of thousands of atoms. Uh, uh, we, we start with, with lots and lots of atoms in some sort of a harmonic trap. It might be a magnetic trap. It might be a laser trap. And very often, we will turn that trap off in order to start doing the experiments. But sometimes, we leave the trap on. And then, we apply this optical lattice. Now, remember. The optical lattice period is half an optical wavelength, and this is uh, uh, 100, 100 or hundreds of microns across. So there are many, many lattice uh, uh, sites across here, but I've just represented this as a few. So when I do that with a one-dimensional lattice, it divides the condensate into an array of these thin pancakes, each of which can be thought of as being a miniature Bose-Einstein condensate. Now, one of the things about a Bose-Einstein condensate is it represents a huge number of atoms, hundreds of thousands of atoms, that are in exactly the same quantum state, the same quantum state of center of mass motion, the same internal state. So it's one wave function that is occupied by a million atoms. And when I divide it up, it just takes that wave function and divides it up. So that means the phase of that wave function all the way across, for every one of those little uh, pieces of condensate, it has the same quantum mechanical phase. So now let's think about this. Here I've got uh, uh, a few hundred little uh, condensates, all of which have the same quantum mechanical phase, because they all came from the same uh, parent condensate that was a single wave function coherent across the whole uh, 100 microns. if I turn off the optical lattice and allow those little miniature condensates to expand into one another, which is to say to interfere with one another. What that means is that I have a whole bunch of little sources 
waves, of matter waves, all of which have the same phase, and they're interfering with one another. This is exactly what happens when you shine a laser into a diffraction grating. Each opening in the diffraction grating uh, is a source of an expanding wave, and all of the sources have the same phase because they came from a single laser beam. We have the same situation here. Each one of these little miniature condensates is a source of expanding de Broglie waves, matter waves, and they all have the same phase. And so they interfere with one another to produce the same sort of diffraction pattern that a diffraction gradient will produce. And here is that diffraction pattern. Now, here is the, the central uh, zero order undiffracted peak. There's the minus one, the plus one order. Uh, you can almost see the, 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 the second order ones, the, the, the plus and minus two orders here. Uh, but this is a standard technique that we use. What we're, one of the ways of thinking about what we've done is we've measured the momentum distribution of the atoms in this uh, uh, condensate loaded into an optical lattice. Let's think about that for a moment. We, now, we have up here a, a wave function that is periodic in space. If I take the Fourier transform of a function that is periodic in space, then I'm going to get a function that has features that are periodic in momentum. And the periodicity of momentum is what we call the reciprocal lattice vector. It's just the uh, uh, Planck's constant divided by the lattice spacing. So that means that the momentum wave function of this thing held in the optical lattice is a number of different momentum states that are separated by this amount that we call the reciprocal lattice vector. That's what the momentum wave function is. If I turn the lattice off, those momentum components are free to uh, uh, propagate in free space, and they do. And here they are. These are, are the main three of those momentum components that represent the Fourier transform of that uh, periodic wave function in space. So what we are measuring when we release the condensate and then just let it expand for a little while, and then after a few tens of milliseconds, we take a picture of where the atoms are. What we are doing is measuring the momentum distribution of the atoms. And this is one of our standard and quite powerful tools for studying uh, condensates. So this picture just emphasizes uh, the connection between what we do and diffraction. So here is a, a condensate held in an optical lattice, but not yet released. And then, as a function of time, we show the picture taken as this condensate expands. So this is time, and this is, uh, is space in this direction. And you can see, as I go further and further in time, this diffraction pattern spreads out, just as would happen if you shine a laser through a diffraction gradient. If you go further away, the diffraction pattern is more and more spread out. And how much it's spread out angrily is determined entirely by the wavelength of the, uh, of the laser and the spacing of the diffraction grain. So we have the same kind of thing here. OK. So how are we now going to study this new substance, this uh, uh, gas and incredibly cold atoms in a periodic potential? We're going to use the same tools to study condensed matter systems since the beginning of, uh, of applying quantum mechanics to condensed matter systems. We're going to use uh, block states and band structure. So let me remind you about block states and band structure. Uh, a block state is the, um, the solution, the eigenfunction uh, solution to Schrodinger's <laughs> equation in a periodic potential. And the nature of that, uh, of that solution is a function that we usually call u that is periodic in the lattice spacing. It's not surprising that if we have a periodic potential that the wave function has uh, a part, at least, that is periodic in the potential. And then it's multiplied by a phase factor that uh, uh, is expressed as e to the i qx over h bar. Now, if we were in free space, this function, this phase factor, would look like the, mom the momentum, uh, um, an eigenstate of momentum. It would be the wave function corresponding to an eigenstate of momentum. 
So what we've got is a function that's periodic in space times a function that looks like uh, an eigenstate of momentum.